Well, I'm going to share a little bit about this song that's kind of funny. Um, Hold on one second. What I wanted to say is that we often read meaning from our own experience in, into the lyrics that we hear. I read up on Sound of Silence and uh, it turns out that Hello Darkness, Paul Simon would go into his bathroom and turn off the light and he loved the acoustics in his bathroom. <laughs> so that's the origin of Hello Darkness. <laughs> <laughs> now, I realize that I'm not following any chronological order yet. We will make our way to the 60s. But I want to go back for a moment his writing. In this poignant song, here is how Yip Harburg described the tragedy of the Depression. And please again.
There is quite a story to the origin of one of the most popular American songs of all time. Woody Guthrie was irritated by Berlin's God Bless America. <laughs> he found it overly patriotic. And it annoyed him that it didn't recognize how hard life was for so many Americans as the Depression dragged on. So in 1940, he decided to fight music with music. And he came up with This Land is Your Land. But interesting, it was originally called God Blessed America for Me. <laughs> Just amazing. All right, well, let's see. Let's see if this is reflected. <laughs> this land is your land. Exodus from Egypt is a powerful ritual <coughs> to explore the meaning of freedom today. And in fact, the Seder ritual asks us to take to heart the words of Martin Luther King that no one is free until we are all free. So as we know, these words were taken to heart by Robert Allen Zimmerman from a middle-class Jewish family in Hibbings, Minnesota, better known, of course, as... Yes, probably the greatest of all poets of the American folk song era. His outrage translated into some of the most powerful and enduring folk songs. And a little bit about Dylan. I have to say I wasn't a Dylan lover, um, only because I found it a little hard to listen to him sing. <laughs> but wow, what an eye-opener to hear the depth and breadth of his writing. <clears throat> when he was 22, he heard about an incident that inspired a song called The Lonesome Death of Hattie Carroll. Anybody familiar with that? 
you? Yeah. So the story is this. The very day that Martin Luther King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech, Dylan heard this story, and this is the story that he heard. The winter of 1963, a man by the name of William Zansinger walked into a Baltimore hotel bar. He had a toy cane and he was drunk. When the all-black wait staff was too slow to serve him, he yelled racial epithets towards them, and he struck Patty Carroll, one, a black waitress, a 51-year-old mother of five children. He struck her with his cane, and she had a stroke and died. And Zan Singer only served six months in jail. And this is what Dylan wrote in the song. He was so infuriated, he described the soft barbarism of an apathetic white liberal America that averts its eyes away from the deaths of so many Hattie Carrolls. As part of the gathering at which MLK delivered his dream speech, Peter, Paul, and Mary sang two songs. One was Dylan's Blowing in the Wind, and the other, Pete Seeger and Lee Hayes' protest song, If I Had a Hammer. So that's the cue for our <coughs> I cried when they shot Ben's river. 
tears ran down my spine And I cried to shot Mr. Kennedy Who's God lost a father of mine But now the man's got what was coming He got what he is for this time So I'm me, love me, love me I'm on the road Get it? I go to civil rights rally and I put down the old VAR. VAR, that's the dikes of the American Revolution. <laughs> Mary and Cindy and Sammy. I hope every colored boy becomes a star. But don't talk about revolution. That's going a little bit too far. So love me, love me. He followed in his father's footsteps as a protest singer. You may not know that he might possibly have been influenced by his maternal grandmother, Eliza Greenblatt, who was a celebrated American Yiddish poet. So Arlo's Alice's Restaurant is 18 minutes of protest. <laughs> All right, we'll only sing through it twice. <laughs> Six million Jews, and there 
uh, one of the books I read talks about Dylan as a uh, mystic poet and philosopher. Very interesting how biblically steeped, uh, how prophetically steeped he is. So it's also been suggested that his song, Forever Young, was inspired by the traditional Shabbat blessing that a parent offers to a child. Interesting. So, the Canadians over here, maybe <laughs> Leonard Cohen is undoubtedly the most prolific poet of Jewish content. I grew up in Canada, as you heard, where in the 60s, Cohen was revered as a poet, but not so much of a folk singer. He descended from a long line of rabbis and maintained his Judaism even when he was a practicing Zen Buddhist or whatever else. Uh, but it could fill a whole book to study the biblical references in his poetry. His story of Isaac, very different from Dylan's, is a chilling retelling of the biblical story of the binding of Isaac. And it starts, the door it opened slowly. My father, he came in. I was nine years old. And he stood so tall above me. Blue eyes, they were shining. And his voice was very cold. Said I had a vision. And you know I'm strong and holy. I must do what I've been told. So we started up the mountain. I was running. He was walking, and his axe was made of gold. That's the beginning of the binding of Isaac. He also wrote Who by Fire, which is an interpretation of the ominous High Holy Day prayer in Mitana Tokef, where we talk about the power of this day and it. Who will die by fire, by water? Who in the sunshine? Who in the nighttime? Who by high ordeal? Who by common trial, who in your merry, merry month of May, who by very slow decay, and who shall I say is calling? Cohen's <coughs> Hallelujah has become incredibly popular. And in a recently published book that's called The Mystical Roots of Genius, written by Ferry Friedman, Harry Friedman, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> I need to enlarge my notes. <laughs> uh, he notes that Cohen suffered from a depression. And he said that Cohen would have identified strongly with King David, a fellow musician. And Friedman wrote this, which I thought was quite amazing. He said, David messed up. David's kingdom was destroyed. And yet, he sang, Hallelujah. Because when you don't know how to make sense of anything, when you failed, when things go wrong, all you can do is sing hallelujah. All you are left with is praise God. Very religious idea. Let's join together.
Jewish content, much less eloquent than either Cohen or Dylan, is a Texas cowboy by the name of Kinky Friedman. Anybody yeah. All right. He packed his songs with sentiments like, ride em, Jew boy. <laughs> And they ain't making Jews like Jesus anymore. <laughs> I'm not going to play you kinky because boy, boy. Um, but I love this. Kinky insisted that cowboys and Jews have a common bond. They are the only two groups to wear their hats indoors. <laughs> Anyhow, we've spent a lot of energy on male Jewish folk singers, and I don't want to ignore Jewish women folk singers. In 1966, at the age of 14, Janice Ian wrote Society's Child, which is about an interracial romance forbidden by a girl's mother and frowned upon by her peers and teachers. And I apologize that I didn't get the words up on the screen, but if you know this, I hope you'll join me. Receiving hate mail and death threats 
as a response to the song, and a radio station in Atlanta that played it was burned down. That's something. So early on in this presentation, I mentioned the 60s as a time of women's liberation and feminism. It was a revolutionary idea that a woman was entitled to claim her female sensuality. And this was Carol King, a young, natural woman. She started, as you may know, she started as a behind-the-scenes songwriter at the Brill Building in New York. And she became what the Washington Post called a singer-writer. But best of all, she did it without changing herself at all. Her first hit, which was written with her husband, Jerry Goffin, was Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow?
apparently we share a great great grandfather. <laughs> Not a great great grandmother because apparently there were multiple marriages. <laughs> uh, but now I'm going to move us forward and to another Jewish singer songwriter who is really um, credited for bringing forward a feminist voice in her writing. Can you guess? Many of you may know. Nope, nope. Now I'm going to move us into synagogue or different. Debbie Friedman. Yeah. Debbie Friedman died 12 years ago at the age of 59. The biggest name, undoubtedly, in the realm of Jewish religious songwriting. Now, she was influenced by Peter, Paul, and Mary, Joan Baez. But what was so magnificent is that she breathed new life into ancient biblical texts and liturgy. So a great example of her creativity in taking a biblical story, we all get to hear about Moses, but rarely do we hear about Miriam and her timbrel. And so she gives voice to the often ignored women. All right, here we go.
early in this presentation, and I hope you'll accept an apology. We're almost at the conclusion, but a bit more. The question, did their Jewish backgrounds play any part in the songwriting of Jewish folk singers? And clearly there is no one-size-fits-all. I can say that I loved so many songs of the 60s, and I understand their power to touch our hearts and to inspire us. On one hand, they are visceral reminders of our history. They also have immense power to shape us and to give voice to our conscience. As Jews, we are reminded that tikkun olam, repairer of the world, is a treasured value. Clearly, this theme is woven into countless songs. There's a beautiful line by composer Harold Arlen, who paired up with Yip Harbor on the song Somewhere Over the Rainbow, but I love this. He said, music doesn't argue, discuss, or quarrel. It simply breathes the air of freedom. I thought that was extraordinary. So we would like to conclude in song together, but before we do, uh, a huge thanks to all of you for sharing your voices. To hear you is really magnificent. I want to thank my sister-in-law, Nina, for joining us, and thank you to Esther and to John Workman. John has been taking care of the slides so that you can sing along. And, uh, again to work with the wonderful Arlene Hajimian on piano. So now, please join us and we'll conclude with this. The song that closed the Newport Folk Festival in 1963. Pete Seeger, Joan Baez, Peter Paul and Mary, Theodore Bakel joined Bob Dylan on stage for the nine questions of Dylan's iconic blowing in the wind.
such an enchanting, inspiring, passionate evening that I don't think we'll ever forget. You, you don't know how much research Joey put into this with love, and it shows. Don't you think we want them back next year? <laughs>